So today we're here in London and we went to the Victorian Albert Museum where they have an exhibit, Ocean Liners Speed and Style. Now, I'll be honest with you, when we were getting ready to go through it, I thought it was just gonna be a rushed exhibit that's kinda not interesting that we were just going to for the novelty of it. You know, we're in the area, might as well go. But I actually very much like what they did with it. And they are there until the 17th of June. So there's a little quick plug for them and I better get on editing this video. Now, one of the cool things that we came across on the descriptive plaques throughout and under some of the different artifacts that they have in there is the reference to focal points on these different ships, especially uh, starting in the beginning of the 1900s and going up until about the mid 1900s when, when ships really started to modernize. Uh, and these focal points, as you were saying, they were often referred to as ship's plaques in the beginning of mm -hmm. their usage, and even a little bit before 1900. They've also taken on different forms. And back when they were plaques, they would have represented not just the ship, but the nation they came from. And even the company that ran them. And the company, yeah, yeah exactly. Well, very often when you have companies that are uh, very nationalistic or even sponsored by the nation, you have... A, a huge crossover between the company and that country. Yes. With, uh, with the German lines, you see that very heavily. Mm. Uh, also with Cunard being sponsored by the British government. Uh, you don't see it in White Star Line because White Star Line is it's just own thing. its yeah. own thing built by Harlan and Wolf, which is also its own thing. So um, we see early on in the 1900s, their, their focal points to represent the nations, especially with the war coming up, the yes. First World War coming up. Everyone's getting very patriotic and very nationalistic and they want to show off their pride in their country, which to a certain extent is quite good. And it, it certainly leads to some very nice focal points. Like I saw that German panel and if my recollection serves me right, it said, unsere Zukunft liegt auf dem Wasser, which means our future lies on the water. Yeah. And of course, at this time, Germany is building up its navy. Expanding. Exactly. Empire. Exactly. Now, the German ocean liner companies were also reflecting this naval buildup, being seafaring vessels, of course. They, too, wanted to dominate the seas, the yeah. commercial seas. So uh, they, were, they were building these up at the same time, and they have this beautiful painting in an elaborately wooden carved panel and it had the plaque on it that's, and, and the, the motto saying that their future lays on the sea. Very classical. It was. Very, very German and classical, yeah. I think. It was just that almost almost biblical looking. Yeah, um, like this little, Wagner type yeah. piece. It was very like cool, that. yeah. Was yeah. Really nice. um, I liked that. I liked it. And it was quite cool for that to be the first major piece in the exhibit that you yep. see. It gives you this amazing impression of just what you're going to be getting into. You'll find that a lot of these particular sort of, be they murals or, you know, carvings or paintings or whatever the case may be, they, they are made up of a lot of symbols, like a lot of symbolic, um, lost it. The whole thing's very allegorical. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. That's exactly what I was trying to get to. I know. But I couldn't quite grasp that. Um, so you, you find a lot of pieces that reference exactly what they're trying to get across, the point that they're trying to get across to their audience members, and they're almost advertisements within themselves as well. Um, they're not just, um, you know, like a motto or anything like that. They are fully explaining the intention. Centerpieces of these ships, the central plaques, as they were calling them in the early 1900s, began as a very vague kind of statement. Every ship has its own focal point. In fact, you'd see this in a lot of houses, like mansions and palaces. Everything it does have a focal point to it. Yeah. So in the earlier days of steamships, you have the Great Britain, you have the Great Eastern, two of the ships by Brunel. They would have this grand saloon, all right? And uh, they'd have an upper saloon and a lower saloon, and these would be massive rooms that run, um, not the full length of the ship, but a good portion of it. 
They would serve as the ballroom, they'd serve as the dining room. This was the visually impressive part of the ship. This is what you always see. Yep. If you look up the interiors of these ships and you look for contemporary drawings or in rare cases, photographs, it's always these rooms. Yes. No one bothered with any of the other rooms. rooms. Exactly. Uh, the scope is really wide on these old ships. You have a massive room that stretches a good portion of the ship. And then in the late 1800s, they started focusing on smaller things, yeah. which were the centerpieces of that room. So basically they gave the centerpiece a centerpiece. Yeah. And you see that in the German ships. And um, you see that in the Olympic class. Because the centerpiece of the Titanic and the Olympic was the Grand Staircase. Easily. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, people talk about the, the clock panel at the top being the most significant part of the staircase, which it was, but the whole staircase itself works together to still convey that same mm -hmm. message. So the focal point of these particular ships um, was obviously right in the place where everyone would be gathering. Um, so you would have, obviously on Titanic Olympic, there would be that D-deck reception room that would extend all the way up the staircase and also all the way along the ship as well through into the dining saloon. So there are all these incredibly populated areas that everyone would have to travel through and everyone would see. And of course, if you go right off the top, that's that's the most important piece. What I think is, is interesting about Titanic's Grand Staircase is you have the necessities yep. on the forward Grand Staircase yep. and the optional things on the aft Grand Staircase. You know, all the, all the restaurants you could go to, uh, the Cafe Parisien, the a la carte restaurant as an option. Yes. They're all in the aft end. They're not the centerpiece. And please correct me if I'm wrong. They're not the centerpiece. And then, of course, you also have the barber shop up there. But in the forward grand staircase, you have the dining saloon, which comes with your ticket. Yep. You have the entrances. Um, the only real optional thing that I can think of that's coming to mind is the Turkish bath down at yep. the bottom. Which isn't even really part of the, the main staircase. No, it's not, because it, it kind of terminates at D-deck, yeah, and yeah. then it just goes down a little bit farther. Even even E-deck, I would, I would say it terminates at E-deck. Well, yeah, because that's where the well ends. Yep. Yeah, you're right. It does. It, it terminates down at E-deck, and then it has like a little auxiliary <laughs> side afterthought of a stairwell going down to F deck, yeah. But then you also have the purser and inquiry office. Yes, so which are integral parts of the operation. Very the much so, very much so. You have all the necessities on the forward grand staircase, yep. and they do that so that you're constantly on this centerpiece. And the centerpiece goes all the way up, and it leads to the honor and glory clock panel, yeah. which is the ship's plaque, as you were saying. Exactly. And of course, it's lit by the dome. Yep. And there's the cherub right yep. there. You have everything pointing to it. Yes. And even uh, people have described as well going up the staircase as an ascent to the heavens because that's what the dome represents. It represents the heavens. Um, the the center chandelier is essentially the sun. Um, the Greek key pattern that runs between that light fixture and the rest of the dome actually represents eternity and the heavens. So um, mm. as you're climbing that staircase, you know, getting close to that massively lit room at the top, that's what it's meant to represent. I've seen a lot of Greek key in the ship, and there's yes. a lot of Greek mythology referenced throughout yes. the ship. Well, the namesakes. Yeah, well, that's the big thing, too. Mm -hmm. But then you also have um, the statue of Diana, which I think was Roman, but... Uh, no, they're both. Well, no, I, I, the myths cross over, but the actual name, Diana. Or Goddess of the Hunt? Yeah, I, I think that was, that was the Roman Roman or Greek? Name. That was the Roman name, I think. Yeah, okay. It doesn't matter anyway. We, I don't want to go into themes. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. But that's that's the Olympic and Titanic, or at least what we can assume of the Titanic because records are so poor on that ship. Yes. However, the Britannic was different. Yep. The Britannic would have had its own clock panel, just like we see on the Olympic and the Titanic, assumably. No um, painting. What? No painting. What do you mean? That was a, It was an image that went around on the internet a while back where they had photoshopped in a, it was a painting of like a landscape that went off to like a, like a small building. I saw that. Yeah. And everyone was talking about it and everyone was asking, is this what Britannic was supposed to look like? But there is no confirmation of that. And I don't think anything references that at all. Where did that someone, even come from? I don't know. Someone just photoshopped a picture and just said, this looks nice. I saw a picture of a Starbucks photoshopped into yeah, the Instagram. I think that, that was Kyle. Well. Was yeah. that Kyle? <laughs> he was talking about a modern day ship and what they'd do to it. Yeah. No, I know. I'm just saying you, you can Photoshop anything, as yeah. we know. Um, but that that particular one perpetuated that myth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a clock panel in the Britannic cutaway. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. The artist's impression cutaway shows a clock panel with a clock in place. That's 
pretty solid, I would say. Reminiscent of Honor and Glory. Yep. But I think the biggest difference to Britannic's centerpiece would be the pipe organ. And that is in the main grand staircase, right? It would have been right yeah. across yeah. from the Honor and Glory clock. The wood staircase. Now this organ was built fully. Yep. And it still exists today and it's, it's functional. So it's in Germany, I think. Yes. Which is where it was built. Yep. And then it was installed in a church or a house or... I know it's at a, like a music uh, hall? No? Music school? A or music school or something? It's in Germany. It's in, it's in it's installed in Germany. Yes. <laughs> and then of course later in the Olympic they painted it all green. <laughs> which, I don't know what they were thinking. I, I get that they were trying to modernize. Keep up with the times. Yeah, uh, I know, but I feel like this is not just us speaking in hindsight. Mm. I feel like so many people even back then looked at that and was just like, what the hell is this? <laughs> they had to have, right? No, no not really. No. no? no. That's what everyone was doing at the time. I'm yes. sure there were modifications made to other ships that were very similar. Yeah. Um, they yeah. they yeah. had to, to keep up with the taste because if they didn't, they would look old fashioned and no one would care. Her designs were really old fashioned, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so even though we uh, think of work. when she was manufactured initially, when she was uh, put out to sea, she was very sleek. That was, I mean, the Olympic class liners were very sleek and they didn't have all the vents on top or anything like that. They were very, very clean lines and that was modern for back then. And then all of a sudden she wasn't. The interiors were very, very dated, quickly. Very quickly. Yeah, that's right. As soon as the war ended, I'd say, yep. you know, uh, just like the Queen Mary. Yes. She had like three or four years of, of sailing as she was originally built and then pushed into war service, yep. and then after the war she comes out and is not going at full steam. No. I mean that metaphorically, <laughs> not, not literally. All right, so also contemporary to the Olympic and the Titanic, we have the Cunard liners, we have the Lusitania and the Mauritania. And uh, what would their centerpieces have been? I would say for the Lusitania, the dining saloon, because it's about including that that dome at the top it's about three stories and you can dine at either level as well from what i understand of the two levels yep um so that would be the centerpiece i would say but they still did have quite you know grand staircase entrances it just wasn't the sweeping staircase that was the the big the big deal on the olympic class i would say now the dining saloon on the olympic and titanic was that that was the biggest room on the sea the largest at room at sea at yeah. the time but it was it was only one level so they kept it all at one level, but they had the alcoves, so about three either side, um, and then they kept it, you know, it was all large, it's just, it's not two-story. Yeah, let's, let's touch on the 30s now, all right? The Queen Mary and the Normandy, which were rival ships, more or less. The Queen Mary being a Cunard liner, actually a Cunard White Star liner, because the two companies merged they in had. the 30s, yep. uh, and the Normandy being a French line. The Queen Mary, which is still around today, and anyone who has been following our YouTube has seen probably a few tour videos. We visit it as often as we can. It's the best way to step back into that era. Interestingly, what we saw in this exhibit was quotes about people who were actually kind of complaining that the Queen Mary did not have a centerpiece. Now at this point in history for ships, the centerpiece was sort of shifting yep. a little bit. It was starting to focus more on the passengers instead of the ship itself. It was trying to give the passengers an experience. You didn't see that so much in the early 1900s. It was all about the ship and then you go to it and you sort of just tour the ship and you're there and you relax for a little bit, especially on the English ships. But with the Queen Mary and the Normandy, it's all about your experience. It's, it's kind of like the first evolution of cruise ships. You know what I mean? Yes. It's still functioning as an ocean liner, but it's about the experience too. Ships were starting to have what's called the Grand Descent, which is the stairwell going into the dining room. You actually see that on the Titanic and the Olympic because yeah, the Grand so Staircase do. goes mm -hmm. down into... But the Grand Descent goes back to the early 19-teens. Yeah, yeah. Actually, 19 so, yeah. 1910s onwards, I think, is, is really the starting point for mm -hmm. that. But they start making that the centerpiece yeah. at this point, too. Well, in the 19-teens, they do. Really? As the ship centerpiece? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Like the Ile de France and the early um, line of France, you know, their gigantic stairwell is connected right to the dining room. So that's okay. the, the whole point of it is that the, the fabulous first class passengers can make their dramatic entry into the social halls with the with the, the big pieces behind them and the, the, the sweeping staircases and that's the whole 
point of this grand descent. It was almost a catwalk, really, wasn't mm-hmm. it? Mm-hmm. It was you'd, you'd like show a... off your gown, you'd, you'd walk down the stairs, and everyone would have their little look, and then you'd go off to dinner. It was like runway modeling, yeah, very briefly, yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to fall down the stairs. No, yeah, you do not. <laughs> which would be a lot easier on a ship. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's something to think about, isn't it? It is there on the Queen Mary, but it's so easy to overlook. It's behind gates, and it kind of just comes out of this this closed-off area. I think it was like the, called the Captain's Descent or something like this on the it Queen was, Mary. But that, well, that was you're talking about the special entrance for the captain. Yeah, right? the, yes. yeah. That, so that's only only he uses that to get the dinner. His guests too. Oh, I, I was just From, saying. Well, then still, it's it's very. It is. It's, it's just a very a, exclusive stairwell. Mm-hmm. But it is there. But it doesn't. It, it gives no descent. You just open. It just exactly. You, you just come out these. Gilded doors. It's a grand entrance. Yes. You know what? You're right. It's it's not really there on the Queen Mary. No, there's no like I... there's no like grand staircase. There's no nothing. They actually used elevators. Finally, you know, as, as another like means to get around. There's more of those. I would argue that it, it's all from the austerity of the times. I mean, they they barely finished the ship to begin with, and they had to cut back on so many things. And maybe this is one of those things that just wasn't essential. Mm-hmm. I would say that's. But if we look at the Normandy. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the Grand Ascent on the Normandy? That one is interesting because they've gone to a lot of effort. They've they've moved the funnel uptakes to either side of the ship so that you can have a full clear room going all the way down. And it's almost like uh, like gardens going down. Like there's just rows it's upon terraces. Rows of stairs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect terraces, and that leads into this enormous dining saloon that's almost three stories high from what I've seen in photographs. And that was, at that time, the biggest room on the seas as well. Yes, yeah. You can see it on Father Peroni's models. You start elevated, and you just have several stairs. And it's they, not a, they widen as well. The room yes. widens with each, each kind of tier. Exactly. In fact, you can go on the stage in the dining room. I think at one end was the stage, and you could look all the way across the dining room. Yep. Through the stairs. Yep. Into the the foyer area and then into like one or two other rooms and I think you could see out the out the opening at the end of the ship. And you got to remember as well that the start of this is from these enormous copper doors as well that are all decorated and things like that. And it's it's not even just an experience for people to see you walking down, it's for you as well. Your perspective changes as you go down. Everything's widening up for the passenger to come into dinner. Exactly. Exactly. So now this has become the ship's centerpiece. Yes. This, but also, as you were saying earlier, before we started rolling, you were saying that the Normandy itself was a centerpiece. Yeah, I mean, everything on that ship was larger than life, essentially, and it was an exhibition of of French art and, and French design, and so it was just all overblown, but in, in the best way, I think. Yeah. I agree. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who have a soft spot for the Normandy. I'm absolutely it's the f- one of them. <laughs> yeah, it's the favorite ship of a lot of people. I know Park Stevenson always says Normandy's his favorite. But if you look at the Queen Mary as well, we were saying it doesn't have that descent. But it also doesn't really have a centerpiece either. There's so many mm-hmm. elements in the Queen Mary which are beautiful, but they're not... They don't steal the spotlight. Yeah. Um, you have the stairs going up, and the stairs are not grand, by the way. They're, yep. they're nice, but they're not a grand staircase but like you see on other ships. It's a regular companionway. It is. Look at it. It is. And then it goes up to the top, and the only thing I could argue as being the centerpiece of the Queen Mary is what's called Piccadilly Circus, named after the uh, part in London that's right over there. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And this is where the stairs come up to the very top deck, which is the promenade deck, or the the top deck of the stairwell. And if you're going up, behind you is a plaster or or, or some material, like some stone-looking material, seal of Queen Mary, the Queen. In front of you is Piccadilly Circus. It's this area of shops. It's still shops today in the hotel, but it would have been bookstore, flower shop, suit shop, souvenir shop. The only other thing I can think of with the Queen Mary is the yeah. clock on the in the uh, saloon. Uh, yeah, with yeah. the uh, with the model going across and the sun which I turned off yeah, and I was about to say. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny as well that some of these areas aboard ships tend to take the name of places on land? So, like, Scotland Road is a perfect example. People just kind of attach their own names to these things. Yeah, well, Scotland Road, you know how that started, right? 
Because it was so busy, wasn't it? On many White Star Line ships for the longest time, long before the Titanic and the Olympic, the main crew companionway was called Scotland Road because that's where the crew quarters all were. And it's named after a street in Liverpool, which is where the ships used to come from, as you know. Uh, yeah. And that's the main street where most of the crew came from. Yeah. And Matt, you often say that on modern cruise ships, mm -hmm. they call that road Broadway. Like they, on the British ones, yeah. In the American cruise ships, you know, they're, they're labeled like I-95, basically. They're labeled yeah. like the major highway systems because it, it's not really related to where the crew sleep anymore because they have separate, you know, cabins because of Solas and so many different um, modern regulations. But still, like, you know, it's the highway of the ship that's hidden from, like, passengers. Exactly. So, yeah, they do. They do take a lot of names. We have Piccadilly Circus, as we were just talking about. The Olympic and the Titanic are not named after places, obviously. They're named after Greek mythology. But the Britannic, named after Britain. The Lusitania and the Mauritania, named after Roman provinces. The SS United States. Oh, what's that named after? Hmm. <laughs> well, you have, then you have the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. They keep naming their ships after royalty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they still do that. Yes. Cunard still continues to do that. You have the a Queen Mary and Queen then Mary Queen Mary, too. Mary too. There's like three Queen Elizabeths. There's yeah. Queen Victoria. And that gives them a certain amount of prestigiousness, I suppose. Like it's still it's, about pride. Yeah, it's about yeah. the pride of a nation. Yeah. So. Makes sense. Exactly. And well, then, no, Normandy's a location. Normandy's yes. a location, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the French line had a ship called the France. That's right, which is named after France. <laughs> it's like, do I say something? <laughs> but they also had the Ile de France as, as another ship. Yep. Was that the French line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's named after the state around Paris. What are the Germans doing? The Germans were having... They were Kaisers. Patriotic back then as well, yeah. The yeah, Kaisers. they were having ships called Well, they weren't Germans. just naming after Kaisers. They were naming after all sorts of Military patriotic and terms and themes yeah. like that. Yeah, they had the... Kaiser Wilhelm the II, Second, Kaiser Wilhelm the Große, um, oh, their, God, my accent. the Vaterland, they had all of that stuff. So the Imperator. Ah, Imperator, mm -hmm. particularly, yeah. Yeah. Almighty sounding. I like. know. <laughs> so. Even though Olympus. It's the Imperator. <laughs> Even though Olympus. Yeah. <laughs> Very often you would see the central point of the ship reflecting the title. Yes. In some way. At even just reflecting the theme of the title, like with the German ships, you see the ship's plaque reflecting national pride and reflecting their their dominance over the seas. Their desire to build an empire. Exactly. And then you have the titles of the ship after imperial German terms. What do they have in modern day cruise ships? You know, they still have like big atriums and like the, the, the new queens that are on the sea. They have... They have almost the grand descent again. They have like the big yes. portrait of the ship and the staircase going down to the dining room and everything. It looked like a plaster sort of portrait as well. I think that one. So there's still that remnant of the older days of, of, of ships on the seas where that centerpiece, that grand descent mm -hmm. or that ship's plaque still sort of exists today. Even if the passengers don't exist mm. for it. They, have, they don't have to make the grand descent anymore. You know, they just want to walk in. Go to the casino, yeah, sit down. You know, you, different times. You don't find that grand descent though in cruise ships. So like a lure of the seas and things like that, you just don't see it. No. You see the atrium, almost like a big hotel, but you don't see the same sort of prestigious um, central focal point as you would on the, the Cunard liners or there, something there like that. There is a staircase in the allure in the Oasis, the Oasis class that goes into the dining room because it's a multi-level dining room and it still has, you know, a big sweeping staircase, but there's no passengers to use it. They just enter in through the doors from the atrium area and they just go to their tables. There's no longer this need to like show yourself off anymore. You know, now there's just a need to get the passengers in, feed them and get them out again. It's because they're the all there year. in Ugg boots and Crocs. Basically, yes. You know. <laughs> it seems like they still keep this, um, you know, it's part of the decor now of these, of these cruise ships to have, you know, the big ones anyway, that have multiple levels just like Lusitania and Mauritania did and the, and the, the Grand Staircase just for the kind of just the design of it, you know. For the tradition of the, it. The tradition almost, yes. The architectural mm -hmm. tradition, yeah. It was an interesting discussion. Mm -hmm. You're the one who suggested that we, we do this discussion, so cool. Thank, Thank you. you. That, was, well, that, was, that was a good idea. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thanks for tuning in and listening to us, man. I don't know what the hell to say. Okay, what, what do we end this with properly? Yeah, so. good, good, good discussion. Yep. Very good, all around. I give it a, a nine out of ten. <laughs> I think we could have done it a little earlier when we're not half asleep. If any of you guys tuning in have other comments on centerpieces, ships that we've missed, there's a lot of ships that we missed, or if you disagree with what we labeled as the centerpieces of these ships, or just anything else you want to add, feel free to drop a comment below, either on our Facebook or on our YouTube, wherever this video is posted, and just share your thoughts with us, and uh, let, let, let us know what's going on in here. <laughs> Thank you, and good night. <laughs>